And so now he goes to art school, and this is orientation, and he's very nervous. He wears a suit to orientation because he wore a suit to Phoenix, and he thought, well, when you go someplace, you have to make an impression, so you're on in a suit. And um, at the orientation, he meets a girl named uh, Tabitha Rex. It's called, she's called T-Rex for short. <laughs> and she's just as kind of out there and different as he is. She's studying fashion design, and of course, he's in, he's in the fine arts program. <clears throat> he's at the orientation. <clears throat> when my turn came, I could feel everyone staring at my face. I could see everyone staring at my face. It didn't help that I was wearing my ill-fitting suit. Why didn't I wear jeans and a t-shirt like everyone else? I shoved my hands in my pockets <clears throat> as they were shaking, and I rambled through my brief resume in a monotone. When I mentioned Santo Tomas, no one's eyes expressed much interest. If you were from Slovakia or Japan, I doubted you even knew where New Mexico was. I sat down out of breath. When the orientation was over, I watched T-Rex as she mingled for a minute or two with her new classmates. She didn't look any more comfortable than I felt. She left the lobby in a preoccupied state. Hi, I said when I caught up with her on the sidewalk. She was smoking a cigarette. The evening traffic on State Street was no more forgiving than the daytime, a blur of lit up missiles without a target. Smoke, she asked, holding out a pack of Galois. I'd never heard of that brand. They're French, very cool, she said. No thanks, I don't smoke. She arched her head away, and a puff of acrid smoke escaped her lips. Her lipstick was a fuchsia red, like the John Cabot's my father planted in her yard. What's your name again, she asked. Will Ryder. She smiled as if catching me in a lie. You said Wilson Lewis Ryder at the orientation. You sounded so serious. Why are you wearing a suit and tie? I'm not that serious, I insisted. Could have fooled me. I bet you, have a, I bet you bring a briefcase to class. This isn't Harvard, you know. I told her I didn't own a briefcase, and even if I did, I wouldn't bring it to class. And they go on, and they end up, um, he asks her out for a cup of coffee, and, and uh, she, she agrees. It takes her a long time to, uh, to she says, I'll be back in half an hour. She shows up two hours later. But they still find a coffee shop that's open. Uh, we ambled down the block to an uncrowded coffee shop with Naga Hyde brush <coughs> and scratched up Formica tops. It was the width of a railroad car and smelled faintly of Windex. Taking off my jacket and tie, I ordered two coffees and a large plate of fries. <laughs> Determined to make a good impression, I extracted a $10 bill from my wallet and laid that on the table for the waitress. Hannah had told me that on first dates, the boy was expected to pay. I bet this is your first time away from New Mexico, T-Rex observed. Who puts money on the table before you get the check? <laughs> oh no, I'm well traveled. I've been to Phoenix. I know what I'm doing. <laughs> that's, that's it, Phoenix? So far, but I have plans. What kind of plans? I want to see as many countries as I can. When I was growing up, I studied a map of the world every day. Did you know there are more than 180 countries? How about you? I've been around, she said, with an edge of weariness in her voice, like a luckless hitchhiker who, who no longer put her thumb out. My father is in sales. When I was younger, we moved around a lot. He was always switching companies. My mom never said whether he got a better offer or he was fired. That probably means he was fired. For the last five years, we lived in Tennessee. My mom stays home and takes care of my brothers. Honestly, I'm glad to finally get away from them all. I'm the only sane one in the bunch. <laughs> Good thing, I said, watching her empty virtually the entire ketchup bottle on the plate of fries. <coughs> Half of them sank completely into the red, sea of red. Her fingers dove after one and slid it into her mouth. Would you like a napkin, I asked? You're too polite. I bet you carry a fork in your briefcase. <laughs> I watched her eat, sl slithering one fry into her mouth at a time like a bird sucking down a worm. Before my, my mother met my father, I said, she moved around a lot too, army brat. Then they divorced and she kept moving. I guess it's in her blood. What's your mother doing now, she asked. She's an artist in New York. Her name's Susan Olmsted. Maybe you've heard of her. Can't say that I have, but don't take that personally. I don't know many artists. Ask me about Valentino or Versace or Jean-Paul Gaultier. <laughs> I watched as she licked her fingers every 15 seconds. Napkins are only for the establishment. You really need to get rid of that suit, she said with a pain glance at me. I think he would open up. <coughs> so he gets to know T-Rex and um, recognizes that she's very much like him. She's sort of an outsider. She's, she's on the margins. Um, she, they, they hit it off immediately, and they're always together. They're, they go to the museum every weekend. Uh, While well, she goes to his class, he goes to his. But they're, they're pretty much inseparable. Many adventures together. And then one day, he's at the coffee shop waiting for her for the rendezvous. And she doesn't show up. This is about three or four months into the school year. 
and he gets really worried, and he goes back to a room, and knocks on her door, and the roommate says, oh, she's gone, she's not here. He says, what do you mean she's gone? We're supposed to have coffee. What, what, she's, where is she? She, she got kicked out of school. She's, she's just, go check her closet, everything is gone. And you can't believe this. I mean, she's never confided to him that she was going to be kicked out of school. And so he's, he's, go, he's so dependent on her now. Um, I, I forgot to say one very important thing, that when they were sitting down at the restaurant, when she's looking at his face, she says, let me look at that face of yours. How did that happen? He said, oh, it, it happened in a fire. And she said, that must have really whacked you out. He said, well, yeah, I don't remember much about it, but it was a big deal. Well, you know what? you got a great face. I love your face. So when she tells him that, I mean, the bond of them is really strong. So now he finds that she's gone. Uh, he finds her phone number in Tennessee. He calls, um, <coughs> speaks to the father. He says, don't, don't call us again. You, you don't know anything about my daughter. She's a total flake. She promises everything in the world. She never delivers. She never finishes school. She's been in 20 different schools. So, you know, goodbye. Don't call us again. Of course, being determined, he is going to go after her. So he decides, I'm going to go, this is my secret plan, I'm going to fly to Tennessee, I'm going to rescue her from her house, I'm going to bring her back to Chicago, I'll make sure she gets either reinstated in school, or I'll get an apartment for her, and we're going to be together again, because this is true love. Because that's what, what's happening now is that love is the antidote to the pain in his face. It's not money, it's, this, it's love, because love makes him feel really good, it makes him feel really happy. He flies back to ten Tennessee, he virtually coaxes her out of the house at night. She's delighted to see him. They go find a cabin in the, some mountain range in Tennessee, and they live there for six weeks together. And it's young love. I mean, they're, they're blissfully happy. I mean, they're sexually happy, they're emotionally happy. Everything is great. But after six weeks, something happens. The relationship begins to fray. She gets kind of antsy, and I'm not good for you, Will. And, and he doesn't know how to handle that. She said, but you have to go. Believe me, it's better for you that you leave. So heartbreaking, he leaves, he goes back to school, and um, he's, he, he goes to his dorm, he goes to, uh, to open the door, and let me see if I have this right, um, and, he, and he tries the knob, and the, the door won't open, uh, and he knocks on the door, and somebody comes to the room, and comes to open the door, and says, Will says, hello, this is my room, what are you doing in my room? The guy says, who are you? He says, well, I'm Will Ryder, and this is my room. And he says, well, basically, no, this was your room, but you've been kicked out because you didn't pay your tuition. He says, well, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm enrolled at the school. So he goes and sleeps on the couch that night, and he calls his mother the next morning. And he says, what happened? What, what are you doing? You didn't pay my tuition like you promised. And she says, basically, well, where were you? I have your visa statement here, and it sounds like you were in Nashville, and you rented a car, and what's going on? And he says, oh, it's just an emergency that came up. She said, well, basically, I'm sorry, you broke your, your oath. Our deal was that you had to stay in school, and you broke it. So, good luck. You know, I'll be considering my financial support in the fall. Go get a job. She said, I, I don't have any skills. I can't get a job. I'm only, I'm only 17. I, I don't know what I want to do. She says, well, that's tough luck. You know, go do it. Go find something. So he does. He goes, finds a job, and, and, he, and he survives that. He begins to realize that his mother um, is a great, he, call, he calls her Zeus because the, Zeus and all the stories about Zeus, the one thing that Zeus always did, he could, he could inflict great pain on you or he could reward you with some, with some, some pleasure. So here is his mother who's constantly, you know, she's doing one bad thing to him and then she does a good thing. She's totally manipulating him. And he doesn't really know how to respond to that. But he decides that, you know, I just, at some point I have to say goodbye to her. So they, they, they go to, he graduates from, from art school and college and now he's, he's gonna go on to New York. Um, uh, suddenly somebody puts an um, envelope under his door and it's got his name on it and he opens it up and it's a check from his mother. It's a check for $100,000. And it said basically, here is seed money for your, for your launch as an artist in New York. You know, good luck. Um, so now she's being the generous mother. So again, he doesn't ever know quite how to feel about her. He goes to New York. Um, he becomes um, a, very much of a struggling artist. You can imagine he's 22 or 3. There's so many artists around. But he, he rents a, a fifth floor walk up, he, he shares a loft with some other artists, he begins to paint, um, he's somewhat satisfied with his progress, money is very tight, even with $100,000, he thinks, I should take half that money and put it toward my plastic surgery and just live on the other half. But in New York, $50,000 doesn't go very far. So after a year, he's, he's, he's sort of running out of money. He has a show, he has a first show, he's a, it's a, it's a co-op show with other artists, and he's very proud of it and he sends his mother an invitation. She's living now in Beacon, New York, upstate, 
and he said, would you please come to my show and see my, my, my first paintings? And she kind of says, well, let me see, I'm kind of busy, I don't know, let me see what I can do. So he waits and waits, the show opens, and he's very excited, and he waits for his mother, waits, and she doesn't show up. But suddenly, a huge bouquet of flowers, gorgeous birds of paradise, it's this it's enormous arrangement, it must have cost $500, and everybody's kind of looking at it, and they're saying, who, who brought these flowers, and there's a note for Will on it, and it, they quickly find out, well, it's got to be his mother. So she's upstaged his, his opening, and he's like totally mortified and totally angry at her. But again, he can't reach her because they didn't give him her, her cell phone. The upshot is not, not one painting sells in the show. He's very demoralized. He goes back to his, he goes back to his studio. He, he works again. Eventually, he finds out somebody came in before the show closed and bought one painting. And he says, big whoop, you know, I sold one painting. Um, he, again, he's being very demoralized, and he decided, I really need to visit my mother one more time and tell her that, you know, just, you know, I, I appreciate what she's done for me, but we just don't get along, and I think my life would be much better if you stop upstaging my own life. So this is the visit when he's up to Beacon. They sit there and they have lunch, you know, they talk, and, and she says basically, yeah, I understand how you're feeling, you, you think that I've, I've been manipulative and all that, but I am what I am, and you just have to accept that. And he said, um, I sat for a while in my chair, now they're having lunch in the patio, by pulling myself out of my chair. I wanted a longer goodbye, one that she didn't control by turning her back on me. When I went into the house, I could hear a television droning from Simon's study. I saw a housekeeper drying dishes. From the other, other end of the hall rose the soft, jagged notes of someone crying. They rippled through the still air like a cord to be pulled on. I had never seen my mother cry, nor even imagined it. The door to her office was open. The room lights were off, but I made out her outline, hunched over a desk, her shoulders rising and falling. Everything about her seemed shrunken. I wondered if she was crying for herself, or me, or us, or what might have been. In a room of shadows, what was unmistakably luminous, up, set above her desk, under the glow of an art lamp. I studied the painting as though I'd never seen it before, even, even if the name Ryder was in indelible writing in the corner. In the context of my mother's and Simon's remarkable art collection, my painting Birds suddenly looked very powerful. It possessed the special energy I had first glimpsed in my studio when I painted it, but at which it gotten lost in the gallery. I was tempted to dismiss her purchase as another act of cunning by a great trickster, but maybe she had sensed the urgency that occupied my imagination and wanted to honor it. I walked up and slipped my arms around her shoulders. Her face was still pressed in her hands. I love you, mother, I whispered. I held her until she stopped shaking, wondering if my words had surprised and unsettled her. Who else had ever spoke of loving her? Simon, for sure, Albert, a former lover once upon a time, and my father early in their marriage. I didn't know if there were that many others. She was someone more to admire and respect than to love. Slowly she reached with her right hand to rest it on my arm. Then she stood and faced me, and with her fingertips traced the ridges of my face. When she released me, I turned and found my way to the door. I walked numbly up the grassy hill to the station and took the train <coughs> back to the city. <coughs> 